Thank you for the uh, kind introduction, and thank you again to the organizing committee for the, for the honor to, to be here today. Um, so I'm gonna talk today about CNS small molecule drug discovery, and just a, a brief way of my background. I was gonna show a map, but unlike many of my colleagues, I'd be a bit embarrassed that it would just be California. <laughs> so I haven't had a lot of global travels quite yet, but that's okay. Um, so my undergraduate career, I obtained my uh, bachelor's at University of Laverne, it's a small private institute in uh, Southern California. Um, actually went there to play basketball um, and did a summer inter re research internship at Cornell. I was there. I took my MCATs as a pre-med major. Unlike, I think, many pre-meds, though, when I took organic synthetic chemistry, I fell in love with it. Um, and then furthermore, uh, an advisor of mine introduced me to Classics and Total Synthesis, which was written by Casey Nicklau and Eric Sorensen in the late 90s. And I was just fascinated by the ability to construct large, complex natural products in a laboratory setting with your hands using small commercial available building blocks. And so that's what really drove my decision to then do my PhD in Casey's lab uh, at uh, UCSD and at Scripps. And I was exposed not only to total synthesis, uh, but also synthetic methodology. And so you can see some of those highlighted here. Um, the methodologies on the left and in the middle on the right, Thaos Strepton, and I have to thank uh, a couple of grad students, Brian Safina and Mark Zach, who also really led the charge uh, on Thaos Strepton that we synthesized in 2004. So I saw this as really a great training ground for biotech and farm industry, good exposure to a broad range of synthetic organic chemistry reactions. And so I joined Genentech in 2008 in their discovery chemistry group. Um, I worked on an oncology program to start mTOR kinase. We advanced a molecule into the clinic and then was fortuitously able to join as chemistry team leader uh, the LERC2 program shortly thereafter. And that was really my first taste of uh, neuroscience and, and seeing a small molecule drug discovery and drew me in. So I'll be mean, talking about LERC in just a minute, um, but I then went on to work on DLK, another neuroscience target that we have a molecule in the clinic, or Genentech, I should say, has a molecule in the clinic uh, in ALS in phase one. Um, and then about a year ago, I was, had the opportunity to join a new company that launched in May of uh, last year called Denali Therapeutics, and I'm currently heading up the medicinal, medicinal chemistry group at Denali. So um, uh, Reina uh, did a, an amazing job already uh, presenting Alzheimer's disease for me, so I don't have to talk too much about this slide. Uh, but really what draws uh, my inspiration and Denali's inspiration in this field, focused on neurodegeneration, is the unmet medical needs, as was mentioned by the previous speaker. And so Alzheimer's and Parkinson's are the two that you hear most commonly about, largely because of the sheer numbers. Um, I already, she already talked about the, the numbers for Alzheimer's disease. Parkinson's disease is just behind in terms of its prevalence uh, and the number of people that are, uh, that are impacted. And so this is not even to mention the number of other different uh, rare diseases such as ALS, FTD, Crabbe's disease, Gaucher's disease, Huntington's disease, lysosomal storage disorders, and the list goes on. And none of these really have any cures or effective treatments and symptomatic treatments are, are, are moderate at best for some of these uh, um, diseases. And so, that's why we're really committed to neurodegeneration at Denali. So to give um, a little bit of a, a highlight then on, on leucine rich repeat kinase two, when I was at Genentech, we started this program in 2009, shortly after the identification of the gene, I believe in 2004. Uh, the interest from Genentech as well as many others in the industry is because of its uh, genetic link. So it, it's known, uh, mutations are known as a, one of the most common causes of familial Parkinson's disease along with uh, mutations in GBA. The most common G2019S actually increases its kinase activity, so it lent itself to a hypothesis that if we could come up with LERC2-specific kinase inhibitors, that we would be able to uh, ideally treat uh, LERC2 patients carrying uh, pathogenic mutations, and then because LERC2 is indistinguishable, or LERC2-related PD is indistinguishable from idiopathic PD, we we're hopeful that this would translate to a sporadic uh, Parkinson's disease patient population. So that was the hypothesis that we had at the time, and why we started the program at Genentech. And so I'm gonna do the team, especially the chemistry team, a significant injustice by showing um, about a year's worth of work on one slide. Um, but due to time's sake, uh, that's what I have to do. So we were able to start with a high throughput screening hit that was fairly efficient. Um, usually then undergo hit to lead optimization in an early drug discovery setting. So we're able to, through computational analyses, matched molecular pair, activity cliff analyses, uh, all of this work is published in, in this publication in 2012, identified this methoxy group selectivity handle, which really brought in a lot of LERC2 specificity. So G7080 was a superior compound from our, from our uh, initial hit. And then carrying out subsequent optimization, we were able to install 
trifluoro methyl group on the pyrimidine ring, and this did a number of different favorable things for us. It brought in cell potency, metabolic stability, and brain penetration, all things that you really have to walk a tightrope and balance when you're working in this space. So then uh, that resulted in 1023, which is a widely used uh, biological chemical probe in a number of different labs that study LERC2 function. Unfortunately, for drug discovery advancement, the molecule was found to be genotoxic, and so we had to look for ways of further improving this. We were able to dial out uh, or rid of a few other uh, uh, off-target kinases of concern, and we were able to um, have a compound that was then devoid of genotoxic issues in 7915. And this was really our first lead molecule that satisfied all of our criteria that we had set forth in our uh, target candidate profile with good brain penetration, selectivity, and potency. And then simultaneously, we were able to address a potential solubility issue of 7915 and bring in some structural differentiation and the advancement to 0877, which was a, an aminopyrazole molecule that shared a lot of the uh, desirable or favorable attributes of 7915. So all of this was accomplished uh, with a really great chemistry team uh, and project team through property and stru structure-based drug design. Uh, we al also worked closely with our DMPK group and Jingrong Lu specifically in developing a rat cassette uh, blood-brain barrier screening model, which reduced animal usage and was able to uh, allow us to rapidly advance the program. We were then able to take the, the two molecules on the right and confirm in vivo target engagements and show strong PKPD relationships with LERC2 biomarkers in rodents and non-human primates. Um, we saw significant PD knockdown at low doses um, in the brain as well as in the periphery. Um, and where this uh, program stands as of today, there was uh, an effort that was undertaken a few years ago, which I think is pretty unique and something that I hope there to see more of in this field. Uh, is a pre-competitive consortium with Michael J. Fox Foundation. So it was really great to work with them over the past few years. And then other industry partners, uh, Pfizer and Merck, uh, contributed uh, structurally distinct kinase inhibitors to this effort as well. And so right now it's still undergoing efforts to really study um, the, and characterize the effects of LARC2 inhibitors. So with that then, uh, a few slides then, and taking a forward look and speaking a little bit towards Denali, um, unfortunately, I can't share specific information quite yet, although hopefully in the very near future we'll be hearing more about some of our research efforts uh, at Denali. Um, but we do feel that the time really is now to be tackling neurodegeneration. Um, we borrow from oncology in terms of their success over the past few decades. Uh, so there was a significant um, uh, attention to the underlying biology in the oncology field several years ago. This led to a lot of oncogene identification, tumor suppressors, and led to some of the early uh, oncology kinase inhibitors that were approved, like Gleevec. There was then a, an effort to look at personalized healthcare, uh, and that led to treatments such as Herceptin, uh, which prior to this medication, HER2-positive breast cancer was seen essentially as a death sentence. Once HER2 was then discovered, uh, this was now essentially described as some physicians as a blessing um, when, uh, when you had an unfortunate situation, when you had a, a, a person with breast cancer. And then most recently, I think there's hopes for uh, immunotherapy uh, with respect to Opdivo and Keytruda and a number of other molecules that are advancing for uh, immuno-oncology. And so all of this was really uh, made possible because of the efforts looking at the underlying biology uh, and an attention to translational medicine. And so what we're trying to do is really apply this mindset that was successful in oncology to the neurodegeneration field. And I don't wanna leave with sort of a, a gloom and doom slide, but I wanted to take this as a positive spin then and talk about what I think is changing in this area and why we feel confident that we'll be able to have an impact here. And so with respect to um, the biology and the previous poor understanding, I think there's been a lot of advancements. There's also been a lot of genetic breakthroughs, uh, which we uh, uh, sort of pride ourselves in and using as a hallmark of some of our target selection at Denali. Um, there's things through GWAS studies, through exome sequencing, uh, through familial studies, and looking at a number of new genetic insights. has also been made possible some uh, sort of um, a clearing of various different pathways through CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing and so forth. The blood-brain barrier is a significant obstacle. Uh, I think it's estimated in tons of different reviews uh, that about 98% of all small molecules are restricted from the blood, or from the, from the, uh, from the brain because of the blood-brain barrier, and nearly 100% of large molecules are antibodies. And so it is a, a challenge, but I think one that I, I love and that I take on, and I think that at Denali we're, we're taking on as well. And I think some of the, the focus and attention to things like free drug versus total drug, 
looking at CSF as surrogate for free, free brain concentrations, uh, implementing uh, transporter assays early in the drug discovery screening process, like MDR assays and so forth, is really helping to improve a small molecule drug discovery. And then there's also been recent efforts um, by Genentech and others in looking at large molecule uh, efforts in, in sort of hijacking uh, transferrin receptors and other things to shuttle things across the blood-brain barrier. And that's another area that we're focused on at Denali as well. And so the last two here, biomarkers and translational medicine, I'll just mention as well that I think these are areas that are improving, um, that there's uh, progress on all of these fronts with respect to biomarkers. Um, as Lisa was asking the, in the, the previous uh, speaker, I think there's been breakthroughs with um, A-beta PET imaging. There's been CSF biomarkers and looking at A-beta and hypophosphorylated tau and alpha-synuclein. Um, there's also been uh, breakthroughs with TSPO imaging and looking at neuroinflammation and, and microglia activation. And then with translational medicine, as, as, as was the case with Herceptin, I think there's been a lot more focus on uh, companion diagnostics and biomarkers uh, in the field and uh, uh, personalized medicine, wearable technologies and um, patient genotyping and so forth that is improving our probability of success. So I think it's as you've probably heard several times, it's about choosing not only the right target and the right molecule, but also the right patient population, the right dose, the right time to intervene, and then, of course, the right biomarkers to be able to, to track the activity and ensure that if you do fail, that you know why you failed, not just that the trial failed and we don't know if it was the molecule or the target uh, that was the, the cause. So with that, I wanted to, again, thank the organizing committee uh, and Lisa for all of the help um, uh, in helping with this experience. Uh, Denali and Genentech, which has been amazing places to work, um, specifically Denali over the last year or so has been really fantastic and we're bu building a great team there in, in South San Francisco. Um, the entire Genentech Lurk2 team and then uh, the Fox Foundation, which have also been great collaborators to work with and Marco specifically who's been leading the Lurk2 efforts. So thank you for your time.